Welcome to our ComposeCast, where we discuss productivity, self-hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac, and with me is my co-host, Jack Moore. How are you doing today, Jack? I'm doing well. I uh, continue to look at the lighting. It looks like I'm going to have to start facing this way uh, to get the full light coming at me, but um, I am recording locally over here, so I'm doing well. It, it, Everything, quote unquote, appears to be going well, but I guess we'll wait until post to see how it goes, see how it really goes. So I'm excited. I'm excited. Uh, the setup was kind of difficult, if you ask me, kind of annoying, real pain, but ended up getting it. Uh, I can kind of walk through that a little bit. How did that How did that setup work for you? So I think it's uh, Mac. So I run Mac OS over here. I think it was Catalina that brought in all the privacy uh, stuff for locking down really what your OS has the ability to look at and permissions got, I think, pretty granular for it, if I'm not mistaken. Essentially what happened is it, it's a, kind of a dirty hack that I use. So the way I installed Audacity was not through, I guess, the App Store is where normally applications come from on Mac OS. I installed it from, I think I just pulled down the, it was either a tar file or a zip file, unzipped it, and I run it as just, I think it's an execute. I just run it as an executable, basically how it runs. Well, I go to launch my privacy settings, and you have to go look under microphone for the application to allow it. And sure enough, since Audacity was not installed from the App Store, it says, hey, I don't recognize this as an application on your computer. I open up Audacity, and it has no idea where my voice is coming from it's blocking it's like hey i'm not letting i'm not letting your voice through nothing's passing through on this microphone sure enough terminal is an application that is you can check or uncheck for privacy settings in in just system configuration basically so what i had to do was allow my terminal application access to you know read and write from the microphone i guess or allow access from the microphone uh, as a source of input so basically what i'm doing here is running a shell script to pop open audacity and somehow some way that's a hacky workaround for getting audacity to work and allow micro put, microphone input now there were a couple other things i had to run i was running into um when i plug in my interface my usb interface to my pc actually audacity does not like that if it's already open so i have to restart audacity if my interface is already on so basically it's just a you know, control C in the terminal and then relaunch it. But really a kind of hacky workaround to get the application installed and working properly. But sure enough, here we are and I'm recording locally. So it's, it's going well. I think it's going well. I guess we'll have to see post here how it goes, but how are you doing over there? <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's funny that you bring that up because earlier today I recorded an interview uh, for my day job, just interviewing one of my coworkers, doing a hallway chat, uh, doing doing that instead of you know being able to hang out at people's desk and just you know. Yeah. You said that you were working on a Mac. Are you upgraded to Big Sur yet? No. Okay, which is fine. OBS uh, is a great way to record stuff and stream stuff. Yada yada yada. It's what I use and I'm familiar enough with it to be fairly comfortable recording simple stuff like this. So I decided to use that for the interview that I had with my coworker. And what I ended up figuring out is that Mac does not like to pipe desktop audio because I wanted to get his recording from Teams, right? So he's he's talking to me. I wanted to capture his his voice. But yeah. Mac does not allow other programs to capture desktop audio directly. So I had to install one of the third-party applications to do that. And it's it's funny. I mean, in, in Linux world, I was able to figure out how to stream uh, media to Discord, right, by a couple of Pulse Audio commands after a couple hours of searching and digging around and, and figuring that out. Uh, and, and that seems to be the paradigm of, of doing stuff on Linux. It's like if you if you dig down deep enough, you know, depending on how dirty you want to get your fingers, you'll be able to do something. Right. Uh, so so I was able to to get around that natively. Uh, I was I was able to to do that just fine. But in Mac, it's 
just disallowed. You, you cannot, you just cannot do it. So I had to find another way to do it. And, and the OBS forums recommend to use a product from uh, Shiny White Box, which has just different audio applications uh, that yeah. they that they yeah. write, um, which appears, I think, is like a pseudo microphone. So it like will capture the desktop audio and pr- yep. show itself as a microphone. That's great and all, except for the fact that the most recent free version does not support Big Sur and does not work on Big Sur. So only the paid version with a seven 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 day trial does. So that was disappointing to see that OBS is officially recommending a non free application. So uh, with some more googling, I I completely forgot about it. Now that you remember, now that you've actually mentioned it, I had tried that at one point running OBS, and it was like, hey, set up this. It's exactly what you said. It's a pseudo microphone that you, I guess, send output from the application to that microphone and that. And then you capture, I guess, that as an input on OBS. OBS? Does that sound right? Yeah. Yeah. Or wherever you want to capture it. So I completely forgot about that. Now that you're absolutely, now that you're jogging my memory here. Yeah, I do know exactly what you're talking about. Because I had to mesh with that application. And I remember just having a heck of a time getting it in Catalina. Like, it's just hard, kind of hard to navigate, honestly. And I figured it it would be just set up OBS and select, you know, my audio device to capture from. And, like, nothing popped up. And I was like, I, I'm, I'm not, like, getting an error or anything. It's just there's nothing there. Not there, right. There's nothing there. Uh, so they, they, they did have a note on that in their forums as to, you know, why that is and how to work around it, yada, yada. So recommending this app, non-free. I started down that road. Um, and then they were going to like send me an email and it was going to be like within the first one to 10 minutes and it took 10 minutes. So I got bored obviously and started looking around for something else. And apparently there's an application by existential audio called black hole that does the exact same thing. Now you're kind of forced subscribed into their mailing list to get the download link, but I'm like, okay, I, I can do that. I, I, I understand that. Uh, it was caught by my works spam filter thing, so I had to go nice. like release it. So that was that was annoying. In quarantine, or yeah. whatever they call it, yeah, yeah. So once once that was released, uh, I was able to get the download link, and it works like a charm. Uh, I was able to to capture desktop audio, and the only thing about desktop audio, and and I'm fighting the same thing here. I mean, just before we went live, I was like, all right, let me close everything that would ping me, um, <laughs> everything that beeps. Because I've got, you know, four different chat systems. I've got an email client, you know, all these kind of notifications that I don't want going off during a stream. Now, what I could do and and how I was going through Pulse is I could route everything to like a default everything sync and then have uh, the Jitsi output from your end routed to like the, the recording sync and, and my headphone sync, right? So I could, I could do something like that where I get all the notifications in my headphones, but OBS doesn't capture the, the beeps. But that's a lot of extra work, and that could, you know, I don't know what the it's, stuff is going to default to. So right now it's just easier to close everything out. Audio is just, it's, it's never easy with computers, and it's frustrating because it's been such a solved solution in the physical space for Ever, you know, I, I I mean, I guess this is why you you usually get like either a hard one certification or, you know, a a degree in audio engineering. And actually, it was funny because the guy I was interviewing today has a degree in audio engineering. Does he really? What, what was was he able? Did, did he? I guess he didn't record it, though. I was going to say that, that. What what did he what did he do? What did he say over there? What do you have as input over there? Well, his story was interesting because his story starts out in the music space and he took a CS course as like an elective. So what he ended up doing was following the CS course as a result of the major in music and was able to uh, follow that more in the CS route. But I mean, he still does music all the time. He he actually coded a plugin to 
it, it might have been Pulse. It might have been something else. But he he re, he he coded a plugin in C plus plus to do like a filter delay kind of interface thing. Yeah. And he's like, because because you can actually in CS you can get into those things, especially like post audio you know fixing or engineering or stuff like that a lot of that requires a lot of computer knowledge nowadays right it used to be all hardware kind of switches and stuff but now you got a lot of software even a lot of ai like any kind of diplosive right when when you hear the sound trying to trying to dial that back and that's going to be hell on you in post so sorry about that but you know trying to trying to dial that back and and fix all those little nuances uh, the the background noise trying to get all that out right. a lot of that you can do with with logic you can you can implement that with with logic that that's programmable um, and being able to do that is is a very specialized skill and requires you know several different specialized domains of knowledge um, one of them being you know low level c++ coding abilities which is not for everyone so i don't I don't blame him for that. He's he's gotten more into scripting languages and and sysadmin type stuff um, over time, but it, it was interesting to talk to him about about going through that. But well, that's good to hear. He's finally getting into something outside of the weeds of C and C plus plus. Man, that is hard stuff. Well, you know, he could write it in Rust. Is what he could do. So and and actually, this is a good segue into our first news item. Um, since you are using Audacity, have you seen the information on the latest update? I did. I was going to talk on that next here. I saw they're starting to add telemetry uh, to Audacity is what I saw. Basically, I, you know what? It looked like they got acquired, and basically what happened was they started. they're going to start to collect data. Um, some of the main things I saw were, I'm just going to read them off here session start and end uh, errors, including errors from the SQLite 3 engine uh, as they needed to bug corrupt, corruption issues reported on the Audacity forum, usage of effects, sound generators, analysis tools so we can prioritize for future improvements, usage of file formats for Im import and export, OS and Audacity versions. So if you ask me, honestly, it I have mixed feelings. It doesn't seem like quite a lot. Now they're still collecting data. Now they're not collecting every single click within the application. They're not collecting what I would kind of call like, there's no doubt they're collecting data, but they're not collecting, you know, user looked at this screen for this many seconds. Also, I don't know if you saw it at the bottom. I liked it. It's still kind of stinks that they're collecting data but it's uh right here as for telemetry itself just to reiterate telemetry is completely optional and disabled by default so they added it but it's op it sounds like it's opt-in opt-in to it for you know maybe developers or for anyone that needs to or wants to share that data um it sounded like I the would, push was really from yeah. being acquired though is what it, i that's the understanding i kind of took away from it i don't know if you thought anything different or took anything different away from the article that was kind of what they pointed at at least what i saw so the the angle that i think makes this interesting is that this is not like firefly 3 which is a web service this is a desktop application this is something that's meant to be offline or or at least used right. offline right and not something that you would expect to normally be talking over the internet it's not a bad thing that it talks over the internet, right? And I, I you know, it. The opt-in is, is definitely the right way to go about this. Now, I'm assuming during install or even during upgrade, there's going to be some kind of a prompt somewhere that's going to say, "Hey, telemetry is now available. Would you like to enable it?" Yada yada yada. Uh, so that right. would be that would be a way for them to put this in front of people's face because without putting them putting this in front of people's face, they wouldn't be able to get a response to it. Otherwise it would just sit there and no one would opt in. So they're, they're obviously going to have to present this to the people who already have it installed and, and who are installing it. Um, now, 
in the PR, it said something like currently almost 100% of the reactions to the over original commit are negative. Um, there are users that are opposed to it. Yeah, the people who are going to be vocal about it are the people who are going to be upset about it, right? Because people people don't understand. It's not that they don't understand it. You know, they're not... The, the users who are technically savvy are going to be the users who are used to filing issues and used to dealing with bugs and finding workarounds rather than than having that collected on its own. I mean, one of the things was, you know, SQLite errors, right? I mean, what does a regular user do when the thing just, right. you know, freezes up? Right, you, right. You just, you, you close it and you reopen it and, and start it, you know, right. do that enough times and maybe you cuss it out and, like, delete the entire project and just start again. Like, oh, well. And that's where stuff like this comes in handy because, once again... It shows developers where to prioritize their work, what features are actually getting used, and and how to how how to get the most bang for their buck. And a lot of open source development is their their scarcity is in their developer time, right? I mean, I don't know if you heard about the it wasn't MIT, but there was some some college that was spamming the kernel developers with it was mit yeah w was it mit uh mm. the, if, if we're thinking about the same thing here um mm -hmm. i think it was mit that put out a research paper on pushing in buggy code into the kernel to see whether or not it would get approved and i think it was 500 i think it was across 500 commits now you'd have you couldn't quote me on that 500 commits but i know i think i know exactly what you're talking about where they were just yeah. pushing buggy code in just to see if it was getting peer reviewed properly and what the and checks were to make it in but at the end of the day you're just wasting people's time and they yeah, say well, i mean it's, it's science but it's a valuable yeah. question it's a valuable question right but the way they went about doing it is it ended up wasting valuable kernel time. developer right. time yeah right and, th and that's it's not unforgivable but man figure out some other way to do that right. that's not cool right. that's not cool at all um so so hopefully this is a way to save developer time and, and, and get some of the cool new features that are actually going to be used and, and cared about out. Uh, the only other thing I had to say here is that it is Google Analytics. Please just use something else. I, I, I don't care what. Just don't use, use their, that. Use their own. Shoot, if they use their own first party, I mean. Find a way to use something yeah. else. Um, <laughs> quick, small, I feel like this is the Audacity podcast now. Um, I had one more thing for Audacity. So I run two instances of it. Uh -oh. So I told you about this Manjaro box I have, right? Yes. So I use Audacity to cut our podcast. And it ends up being fine. It's perfect. And I run, I think it's latest and greatest Audacity on that one. It, it, it runs like a charm. Now, my Mac version over here, if you look at it, it's straight out of 1994. The, the UI is just... I don't even know how to describe it. Terrible. The one on my Manjaro instance, slick. It's dark mode. It's brand. It it looks brand new. It's UI UX is up to date now. This old this Mac version. I only bring it up because I have it right behind uh, where we're recording here, where I'm talking to you. It is. You know, I'm like this close away. It is old time to getting you like a ThinkPad so you can actually just run Manjaro, run Manjaro. on a machine. <laughs> I have it. I have it running. So. Yeah, so I cut it in uh, Manjaro, but thought I'd just toss that, toss that out there. I don't think the Mac one will ever get updated, but um, <laughs> Manjaro is the great latest and greatest for it. So, but okay, enough enough audacity here. I think we're ready for our next news item, next intro piece. Uh, it was on Bitcoin Cash. If you wanted to talk on that, yeah, I I just think this is a good chance to bring it up uh crypto has been fluctuating wildly again uh so there's been a ton of news and rumors and fomo and just a lot of stuff out there right i realized that we didn't explicitly call out the differences between bitcoin and bitcoin cash 
and I wanted to. Well, I uh, I was I was excited to see that you know CNN.com ran a just a very straightforward piece about you know what what is Bitcoin Cash, and don't get me wrong, the name is frustrating, and I will forever hate that this is how that fell out, but a cryptocurrency that looks and sounds a lot like Bitcoin has creeped up into the top 10 biggest digital currencies list, Bitcoin Cash. Bitcoin Cash shares most of its code with Bitcoin, but it is significantly faster at processing transactions. The cryptocurrency is having a moment. It surged more than 11% on Thursday. That was May 6th, 2021. So it surged more than 11% then, and more than 300% this year, according to Coinbase. So CNN decided to take a look at it. And uh, I'm going to walk through this article and insert my own hot takes as we go. Yeah, absolutely. Bitcoin Cash was developed in 2017 as a split off of Bitcoin known as a fork in crypto parlance to solve some of Bitcoin's issues as it grew bigger. Bitcoin, which runs on a decentralized ledger system known as blockchain, can only process a maximum of seven transactions per second, making it a less than ideal crypto for everyday transactions. For comparison, Visa and MasterCard and them handle like tens of thousands of transactions per second. Bitcoin Cash is the version of Bitcoin that implemented an increase in the transaction capacity, digital currency economist Alex Van DeVries told CNN Business. The Bitcoin Cash creators aim to raise the Bitcoin's block size limit of one megabyte every 10 minutes, which translates to a maximum of seven transactions per second, to eight megabytes every 10 minutes. Uh, Bitcoin Cash blocks can go up to 32 megabytes. And, and that's really the, the core of the matter here, and I'm going to continue on in a moment, but what Bitcoin Cash did is there was a disagreement in the Bitcoin core development. The disagreement centralized, centered mainly around how big the block size should maintain. Right. Um, there's a lot of different economics behind it, and incentive models and and a whole lot of things there were a lot of good talks um i'm not going to link to any here because i think i'm going to do a deeper dive into them them later but you, if you look back around 2017 2016 there was a lot of controversy around what are we going to do about the block size and a lot of people came forward and had strong opinions on both sides and bitcoin cash in 2017 I think it was like November 2017, split off, implemented a hard fork because they made a backwards incompatible change. They said, we are going to accept any block that is going to be up to eight megabytes. And there was a block mined, I think it was like 1.2 megabytes. Now, the Bitcoin core code said that that block was invalid, but everyone, who, all the miners who were running the Bitcoin cash code accepted it right and therefore there was a different end to the longest chain of of transactions on the the blockchain and since then they have diverged wildly of course i mean they they are sure now two independent chains with a similar heritage because they all trade they can hit trace their heritage all the way back to the what's known as the genesis block But at some point in time, the chain known as the Bitcoin Cash chain started accepting blocks whose size were larger than one megabyte, whereas the Bitcoin chain rejected those blocks. The creators of Bitcoin Cash, the article continues, wrote an update for the Bitcoin software, which increased the transaction limit as we went over. Bitcoin Cash split in two in 2018 in a similar situation, created another fork called Bitcoin SV. Um, and, and that was a just a, a different fork. Someone said we should change a, a couple other things and it forked off. And it actually since then, there's been probably about five or six other forks off of, off of Bitcoin Cash. Um, now, and, and this is the interesting part about Bitcoin. So currently 
There are four different implementations of minor software that implement the same protocol. They do it in different ways, I believe with different languages and different nuances, but the core agreements shared among them are, are sufficient enough to constitute one similar protocol. Uh, just the way they implement it, it's, some are sure. bigger for bigger miners and clusters, and some are better for smaller miners and you know, kind of one-offs. So the, the Bitcoin Cash ecosystem is, is actually the one I see thriving the most and and it you can see it too in the acceptance rate uh, there's been a lot of maps starting to be posted about you know where bitcoin's accepted you know you see it in argentina venezuela brazil you see it in uh africa and south africa and you see it in different smaller european nations right uh, and and especially over in in several different asian countries in uh, korea south korea japan um hong kong so there are plenty of places that there is a need for cash. And I think the stat is like, there's a 10 time, 10 times larger market out there for daily transactions than there is any type of global currency backing, right? You're seeing a lot more transactions happen day to day than people hoarding money. And and that's how money should sure. be, right? Right. So that's, that's interesting as well. Now, I'm not an investor in this or, or anything, but I use it and, and it uses pretty well. However, the, the name thing is unfortunate in that it's very easy to get Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash mixed up just because of it. The name, I mean, it's, sure. it's history. It was the same thing at one point. Uh, and, and now you have you have two different two different coins from the same chain that if if you go back far enough so i i mean i guess i guess i just wanted to throw that out there to to kind of call attention to that the the, the fact that there is a difference uh and there seems to be a use case for this uh and this has been something that you know may may not be familiar to to everyone out there but it's definitely something that people should familiarize themselves with um Anyways, just just thought it was thought it was interesting. Yeah, I don't have anything to add with Bitcoin Cash. I know it, it, you were starting to get it sounded like so I didn't know there were so many extra forks. I knew there were a couple off of Bitcoin Cash, but I didn't know there were four or five now. I thought there were you know one or two from there. Well, and and I don't know if I wanted to go in there, but recently a bit of controversy was that the Bitcoin ABC developers, which is one of the implementations of the Bitcoin Cash protocol, they started to hard code something into their code, which would send like 8% of every single transaction fee to a specific wallet that one of the developers controlled. Ah, yeah. Convenient. Yeah, it was. Right. It, 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 very much so. What ended up happening was that that did create a fork, right? It, it did create a fork at the specific time that it was meant to be implemented. But all of the other mining nodes that weren't running that software rejected that block. And it ended up sure. being right. basically a, a dud. And, you know, that now they have a bad name in the community and it's just, it's not gone over well. Of course. Of course. I mean, 8% is a lot. Oh, it's Especially huge. Especially taken out of, of every transaction that, ha that hits the chain. Uh, you know, think about, think about that. That adds up very quickly. Yeah. So yeah, and, course, and that I'm, yeah, kind of good to see that. And that's that kind of miners versus developers thing right there, though. I mean, that's a developer just saying, "Hey, you know, we need our compensation." Kind of a, "Hey, we need our compensation too." And the miners like, "Well, look, we get to." At the end of the day, you know, you wrote it, but we get to decide if it's if we're implementing it. Essentially, it's I it's the old developer how... versus sysadmin debate. Exactly. You know, they both exactly. need each other, but man, they do not want to <laughs> get along. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah that's really yeah i didn't even know about that and i'm glad you brought that up that's a really interesting talking piece because it it's exactly that it's that developer versus someone who gets someone who's actually you know i get to decide whether i'm implementing it or not 
and you know the developers wrote it up and said this is what we you know whatever eight percent i'll have to look into that and then just miner said nope no chance so there is a bitcoin cash podcast out there that i'm subscribed to um i might put a link in the show notes it's it's definitely a smaller podcast and they're getting their feet uh under them yeah uh, their audio quality has definitely gone up thankfully that's so, good to hear glad to see that yeah uh, but but i'll i'll put that in the show notes it seems to be some fairly solid content so i, so I hope it it continues which actually brings me to my one and only news item here is that I did not know that WordPress had a podcast. And okay. awesome. uh, as, yeah. as a podcast junkie, I you know love to, to find out about new ones. Not probably something that I'm going to be following. And it, it appears to simply follow releases and uh, major, major events in the WordPress yeah. community. There seemed to be, you know, a sizable one, two, three, a sizable amount. 10 I think um, episodes and uh, I just put the link in the show notes if, if anyone else is a podcast junkie and a WordPress junkie this is a great crossover for you I don't have anything on that one uh, well what's the frequent is there a frequency to them is it once a week once, uh, I think uh, the first one was in 2020 let me see I know you love your podcasts I do I do the uh, the feed is odd it doesn't give me the dates looks like about once or twice a month hopefully they keep it up hopefully they hit uh, they hit eight so they already got to that magic they're, number they're, yeah yeah uh, what's the next one i say 25 i think it's eight then 25 right well is it 8 13 25 is it 50%? oh in the in the oh what is that called what is that called it's a uh, fibonacci it, sequence yeah is that what it is yeah yeah like yeah. uh, the first we go fifty percent make it past the first eight. I think thirteen is the like seventy five percent maybe, and then twenty five is like I don't know. There, I don't know. I don't oh know. no, those numbers no. no, those are download numbers. No, I'm just talking about like number of episodes to be able to get oh, out yeah. and sustain yeah, 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 it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, once you hit, I actually would probably grade that more in the Fibonacci sequence. You know, your first one is going to be a lot one. different than your second. And your totally. third, but like your totally. eighth and your ninth are probably going to be more similar than that. And then by the time you hit 13 and then 21 and then whatever the next number is in that sequence yeah. is important. Uh, and, and we're creeping up there. We just passed 21 on 24 here. So, yeah. Which we have to do a week early. So, I mean, I'm sure the next, the next episode, we're going to have a lot of things, but we don't have, I mean, all the news basically we went over last week. So I was going through everything again, did not see anything new. So uh, just just that that little heads up uh, for the podcast junkies out there. But we were able to get some developments, squeak some developments out of we were out of we this totally week. We totally were. Um, do you so want to dive one into the, some of those? Yeah, one of yeah. the things that you actually probably didn't know about is adding nginx timeout settings for Nextcloud's large files. No, uh, uh-uh. Okay, yeah, that's why so I was this running is... into issues with uh, podcast files and stuff that was over, I think it was stuff that was near a gig, it would fail and I'd have to down, you know, I'd have to start pulling down. Exactly, you know, yeah. So down like 600 meg at a time or something, but yeah. I added a link to the commit in there, which is fairly trivial. It's five lines of Nginx config, uh, but they're... They're talking about the, the connect timeouts and the send and the read timeouts, which if you were to upload just a very large file, not many small files, but a very large file into a Nextcloud server, it would actually end up failing because of the timeout. And so adjusting the timeout allows it to send everything correctly and you know, and, and it doesn't it doesn't time out the, the connection. I mean, how many more times do I have to say timeout? I mean it it, it <laughs> It doesn't. So uh, I was I was happy to put that in. Uh, it's just something I found in the community forums. Uh, so once again, I mean that's that's where we go when we have an issue. You know, that's there there are there are some really good people in the forums, and if you have a little bit of skill searching around, spend a little time, have some dedication to looking for a solution, usually you're gonna find you can find it. Yeah, yeah right. there's people who are running this on the bleeding edge. Like we we run one minor version behind for a reason, right? And that's because most of these problems have already been sorted out by the time it gets to us. 
So I think this solution was posted back in, well, it was actually posted a couple of years ago, but someone updated it in February because, you know, he's, he found a simp- simpler way to yeah. do it. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I made sure to also leave a comment just to say, hey, thanks. You know, this did help. It fixed the issue, yada, yada. So um, always want to make sure to be growing that, that community around these these applications. Uh, and then you implemented the ability to allow local environments to be displayed in Portal. I did. That, that one, it wasn't bad, honestly. It, it was uh, reading some YAML. It was quick. It was very quick. I, I'll tell you what. I had to get my React feet wet again. Um, I knew. I said I wanted to parse this data in Ruby and return it in JSON and read it that way. And I said, okay, this shouldn't be too bad. And backend stuff is very anymore for me, if, unless it's something kind of dip, unless it's something that I don't see on a normal basis. You know, that isn't crud. You know, create update post. You know, create what is it? See, create, read, update, delete, crud. I haven't heard that one. Unless it's something beside outside of that realm or scope, which this was just read. So pull the JSON data from the YAML file. Make sure the YAML file is there. Um, getting that back end work done was really easy. Now I had to get my front end feet wet and reteach myself. I had to go. Oh, so this is how I do React again. Get get my java my javascript shoes wet or on javascript shoes on so that was something that actually took the bulk of the time um parsing the file ended up being pretty easy uh there were did it did it really with the built-in yaml parser who would have thought i didn't even know it was out there i didn't even know it was out there I was like, I was, oh, I, I would have been dead set. I would have found some random YAML library too. <laughs> you know, you know it. You, in the you've on. already included several, several other libraries in here that I had to untangle in my. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, welcome to JavaScript, right? I, I, I'm sure Webpack was one of them. Um, yeah. But yeah, ended up. Portal had a heck of a time just recognizing, yeah. hey, there's a new JavaScript file in. That needs to be, com- you know, compiled, and we need to be able to parse this front end bit. And Portal's like, oh, I don't know what's going on. I can't find this. Uh, blah, blah. Like, you know, I'm like, it's right there. Like, what do I need to do to this application? So I kicked it, basically restarted it. Sure enough, Webpack Dev Server spun it up and got it working. Nice. So now updating those. I think it's going to be a bit of a different story. The UI to read is pretty easy. Now, the U- UI to update, that's going to require a little bit more maneuverability and on the front end and the back end. So We'll take a look. I'm, I'm yeah. sure we'll figure out a way to to work with that. But uh, that's that's coming up. I mean, we got three weeks between now and the next episode. Yeah. So we will definitely be taking a look into, into implementing. That. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and... With that, I, I guess I'll dive into actually the integration discussion, dive into talking more about the applications uh, that we host, that we are, are promoting here, uh, right? that we use in our everyday lives. And one of the things I wanted to touch on today was, uh, I mean, go figure, it's going to be next cloud, but I wanted to talk about encryption, specifically as it relates to next cloud. I don't know how this is going to go. I'm just going to go over it. I, I toss okay. out a, yeah. a, a bunch yeah. of notes here and I'm, I'm going to, to try to make sense and put together a cohesive story uh, as to how we want to use encryption with NextCloud. Sure. Yeah. So encryption is one of the steps to take when designing a system with defense in depth. Here we go over what you need to be concerned about and different implement implementations to consider. I also linked to defense in depth because this is this is a very key concept to understand. Uh, defense in depth is a military strategy that seeks to delay rather than prevent the advance of attacker, buying time and causing additional c- casualties by yielding space. Rather than defeating an attacker with a single strong defensive line, 
defense in depth relies on the tendency of an attack to lose momentum over time or as it covers a larger area. A defender can thus yield lightly defended territory in an effort to stress an attacker's logistics or spread out a numerically superior attacking force. Once an attacker has lost momentum or is forced to spread out to pacify a large area, area defensive counterattacks can be mounted on the attacker's weak points, with the goal being to cause attrition or drive the attacker back to its original starting position. The way this applies in computer science is to say, all right, nothing is ever going to be impenetrable. I mean, just the right. sheer number of breaches that we've seen this year alone should, should solidify that. So what we have to do at that point is say, all right, so if, if we cannot defend perfectly, we're going to have to defend a lot. And what that means is that at every point where we could get compromised, we want to concentrate on defending that point and then defending everything around it and then defending the entire thing. We don't just want to have one firewall and then everything through that has free free access free to, to right. everything we have. Exactly. What we want to do, we want to set up passwords, right? We want to set up passwords for stuff inside of our networks. We want to set up stuff, uh, passwords to get into our networks. We want to set up, you know, uh, different uh, authentication measures within our networks. We want to enable encryption for the data at rest in our networks, right? So if, if something gets popped, right, if something gets compromised, then there are other defensive measures that attackers would have to not mitigate. What's what's the word I'm looking for? That they would have to exploit. You penetrate, yeah, get across. Yeah, to penetrate, yeah. but before actually getting to something worthwhile, they would they would have to do more work than compromise one thing, and that's that's where you have that in depth part of it. It, it comes into play. You you want to have different things around different different ways to defend the same thing. Now, that being the case, we have to understand what the threat model that we're defending against is, because that's going to dictate how well-funded the attacker is, you know, how much expertise and knowledge, or what attack vectors the the attacker is, is going to have, is going to take. <clears throat> so here we start talking about threat modeling. So threat modeling is hard. Uh, the most totally. widely applicable framework that I personally have stumbled across is to frame up your model with respect to the following scopes. Uh, so from lowest to highest, defending against the neighborhood hacker, then defending against corporate surveillance, and then defending against nation state espionage. Uh, and the advice is to consider at which level you would like to defend against when considering the options available to you. Most of the stuff that a lot of people start thinking about is neighborhood hacker kind of thing. You know, people sure. jumping on Wi-Fi, cracking passwords, yada, yada, yada. Um, and, and, and that one is, for the most part, mitigated by a lot of common security measures. And, and we're going to go over some of those here. Uh, and then you have corporate surveillance, which is a little bit more heinous because a lot of them share information with each other, which here's where you start having to talk about metadata and being able to draw correlations between, you know, just huge dragnet aspects of where your where your information lives, right? If you can cross-reference your ISP with your browser history and your logins to different sites, I mean, you, you can put together a pretty comprehensive analysis of, of where someone was when doing what where you may not get the content. And that's where the nation state espionage comes in. They really want to get that content. Now they're, they're re actually really good at getting metadata, but what they really want is to get that content, get that data, get, get in and, and, and grab it much like that neighborhood hacker, except they're going to use all the tools at their disposal and they have unlimited funds. And if you're targeted by nation state espionage, you have bigger problems than securing your next cloud login, right? You, you, you need to have a serious, look at, you know, what's going on here. Because the thing about nation state espionage is that, oddly enough, other nation states don't like it when it's done to them. So sure. a lot of the infrastructure totally. that's in, in place in the various geolocations around the world have different mitigation strategies to 
to defend against those kind of things um, from from other nation states. And then same thing with the corporate surveillance. I mean, even though there is a data market out there, right, there are still people who don't want access that that data is precious to them. Right. So they're not going to just leave it out there for anyone to find. Right. So they're going to be also defending a portion of your interests. Right. And they're going to make sure that your connection to them is secure and, and, and a couple other things along the way. Whereas the neighborhood hacker isn't going to really care about any of those. He's just trying to get into your services. He's probably trying not to get caught himself. So he's taking a couple of precautions, but he, he doesn't care about you in, in the least. And the reason I, I titled this a rubber hose attack vector is, is simply that because <laughs> when I saw the title, I thought, oh man, we're really getting down into it with uh rubber hose attack vector. I immediately think of someone bashing someone's knees in with like a lead pipe or something. <laughs> like, exactly. Give me your it's, password, <laughs> cutting a finger off. <laughs> yeah. It's you, you can, you can secure your encryption you know, as, as well as you'd like. Right. But when someone buys, you know, a $5 tire iron, you know, at the hardware store and comes over to your house and starts bashing you over the head with it and asking you to give them your password, you know, it's, it doesn't matter what kind of encryption you have. You just right. want the beating to stop. So there, you, you have to consider your threat model and, and what attack vectors that your, your adversaries are going to be implementing against you. Right. So if you, if you have a, a fairly, if you're not threatened by nation state espionage, right? If, if you want to start talking about corporate surveillance, Nextcloud is a great place to start because then you can own your own data. And that's a way to peacefully take it away from people who would otherwise sell it. And someone like us, right? We would, we, we are in the business of securing your data and, and, and offering the service to you for this very purpose, which is where we get into the responsibility levels of who's really responsible for securing what at which level. And going through the AWS training, they pointed out three different levels of responsibility, which I think are highly applicable here. Uh, the first is like the physical level and the infrastructure level, right? So who's actually providing you the hardware, who's providing you the server, who's providing you the, you know, heating and cooling, the server right. space, the network, all of that stuff. Um, all of that right now for us is handled via digital ocean. So in diving into that a little bit, there are two types of storage that digital ocean has that, you know, where, where it could be encrypted. Right, so the first is the local droplet storage. So think of this as the hard drive on your computer, right? And this is this is not going to be any kind of uh, object storage or, or, or block storage. This is going to be just where your OS sits. And this storage uh, is not encrypted by default. Whereas their block storage, which is extensible storage you can think of it as you know like an external usb storage Drive, or right. or like a nas or any kind of storage array um, and, and that's actually what it is it's it's a huge storage array that sits next to their compute cluster uh, that is all uh encrypted at rest so what does that mean what does that mean uh if you if you consider that your data if if we're just talking about the local droplet storage if your data is sitting on that at rest as it were you know you you have a file on a computer somewhere on on your server then if someone were to break into that data center and unplug the server take it out of the rack scamper on home with it plug it into their network access it boot it up then they would be able to grab that disk and read the contents of that disk. Well, sure. Okay, fine. But, th and that sounds illogical. I'd, I'd argue that sounds kind of illogical. You're not just going to walk out. You're not just going to, breaching of that physical security, that physical perimeter is going to be difficult in and of itself. Yes. Now, more or less likely, this is where I see the process kind of break down and where this could actually be a problem is, hey, we're getting rid of old servers whatever we migrate you off 
somehow, some way, something gets, you know, you clone it over from one, one piece of hardware to another, you know, let the customer know, hey, we're spinning this up. It's on the new one. Now, what if it, this is where it gets left on the old one? Now, I know vSphere and all that is pretty good about migrating all that data over. It's left on the old one. Someone pulls the physical disks out and just pitches them. They don't degauss the drives. They don't do any kind of physical cleansing of the drives. They don't, you know, take a hammer and nail to them to break them up. Someone pitches them, and sure enough, the garbage man's like, hey, guess what? I got two new drives. <laughs> or, yeah, you know, no, someone that's... at the recycling center is just, like, pl- like plugging them in. and like, hey, there's still data on here. Let's kind of see what's going on here. Still, at the end of the day, both kind of far fetch, but they're out there, right? They're they're vectors. No. Well, and there's even there's even one more that hasn't even brought been brought up yet. But that's if you're able to obtain access to a server, right? Um, right. If you're able to cold boot a server, or you have a out of band like an ILO, like a, you know, you're, you're yeah. able to yeah, have yeah. A, a virtual KVM and boot up a server, you would be able to even by installing like a boot up operating system like DBAN on it or something. Just check the disks at that yeah. point, right? Yeah, you have, a, you have a live DVD on it, you mount the disks and, and all the data is there too. So you don't actually even need physical access to that. Uh, but you do need access to the disks. Right. Right, um, you don't need you don't necessarily need access to the to the server Physical now. Location. That's not the same with their block storage, which, like I said, their extensible storage, uh, their entire storage array is encrypted by default. Um, sure. So they have all that they have that data at rest, right? Uh, so that's that's always good. But keep in mind if someone's if someone's popping a server, and by popping I mean exploiting or or penetrating, right? If someone has has gotten a exploit and has access to a server, then it doesn't matter if those files were encrypted when the server shut down, because the server is running right now, and those files are unencrypted. Unencrypted, right? And which is which is where we can transfer over to you know what is the responsibility responsibility level of the service provider, or the you know the application host or the the operating system admin. Right, so we I, I, I pointed out three things here. We got two that are planned. Uh, one is Lux encryption. So Lux encryption is a way to do this hard drive encryption, as we were talking about, from an operating system level. So that when the operating system shutdowns, it re-encrypts everything on the disk and everything is encrypted. If anyone were to boot the server up or yank the hard drive or throw it in the trash. Um, everything would be encrypted there with the the Lux uh, password. So that's one thing that we we uh, are going to be planning on on implementing. Um, once again, that's not that's not the attack vector I think that I'm most concerned about. However, no. Um, a, another very similar one is uh, encrypted tarballs. So the way we we do backups is we basically compress the entire data directory that we maintain on the on the VM and copy that down and store it locally here. Um, and then we also have snapshots that, uh, this, those snapshots are also encrypted at rest uh, from DigitalOcean. Um, but the, the tarballs, while they are secure in transit or over the wire, right, are not encrypted at rest on their backup storage. Um, so that is something also that Jack and I have talked about that we want to be implementing this this quarter. Um, and, and also something not super concerning. I mean, it's it's in a secu- the, the, the backups are secured, right? As much as any other physical security could be uh, on, a, on a secure network, right? So once again, that's not my main concern. My main concern is someone being able to get into the server and, and especially Lux isn't going to have, uh, you know, help with that. And, and encrypting tarballs isn't going to happen with that because if you think about it, as long as the operating system is running, those files are decrypted. Right. And if I were to have root access on that operating system as it's running, I can see all the files on the server. Um, it's when the server shuts down is when everything gets 
re-encrypted and then we we go back to square one but we want to first and foremost make sure no one gets into the server while it's running which is why we've enabled https which secures all the login traffic all the backup traffic all, all the traffic really that that goes to that server the easiest way to to exploit a service that requires a login is to simply sniff the traffic and you can do that any number of ways you can do that with minimal permissions on a server if you've been able to exploit that you can do that with minimal permissions on any given uh, end end device uh, whether that be mobile desktop what have you if you're able to get that traffic that's that's unencrypted so what we want to have and, and what we were concerned about having first and foremost is uh, secured HTTP, HTTPS, uh, which I did pull up an interesting article with security evaluators and I wanted to go through, they had a, a nice couple of points in saying what HTTPS does and does not protect against. So it protects against, let's see, it encrypts the traffic between your browser and the server to prevent eavesdropping on your web requests and responses. This is often referred to as confidentiality. HTTPS also offers authentication through the certificate authority system and integrity through message authentication codes or MACs. Uh, those are actually the hashes, the CRC that we were talking about last yeah. week. Yeah. That's, that's in uh, a MAC, yeah. So, non-technical users frequently consider HTTPS websites as secure, and HTTP is not secure, yada, yada, yada. Um, but in the rest of this blog post, we'll be discussing some of the side channel and malicious parties can use to fingerprint a user's browsing of HTTPS content, right? So, HTTPS here encrypts everything you send to the server and everything the server sends to you. Now, what it does not encrypt is the DNS lookups, when you ask the DNS service to resolve, can you give me the IP address for my server range? And it says, sure, that's not over HTTPS, unless you're running like Firefox. But that's not something that the server handles though. That's not a communication between you and the server, therefore it's not encrypted, therefore that's something that other people can snoop on. Um, caching, right? One of the things is that browsers do very well is speed up the appearance of the internet and they do that by caching content locally now that's literally storing content that you requested security securely on your computer if someone's able to get in mess around with that cache they can do stuff that the server didn't want to happen in the first place that's a harder side channel to to exploit but it's still out there uh, now keep in mind there are different ways of not exploiting but but gleaning information off of TLS um, through techniques like art spoofing where you're able to um, uh, mimic MAC addresses right. Right. and and uh, intercept traffic um, especially you can you can analyze a lot even just with metadata via login log out times like yeah i can if i just sit there and look at your traffic i uh, it's called i forget what it was but like back in the back in the early days i think it was the fbi they used to profile people based on their water usage because you could tell when someone was home and was taking a shower by when they use sure. their water right yeah so and and as humans are creatures of habit, right? You could kind of count on when someone was going to be home to take a shower. If you analyze, you know, their water bill enough, you know, you, you'd see them get into a habit. Get get, yeah. And then if you needed to, I, you know, ensure that they were going to be in a given place at a given time, that would be a good way to determine, you know, oh, I can see, you know, they're here or they weren't here that day or something like that. So, that, it, that was just a very interesting, you know, it, you can, you can glean a whole bunch of information from the seemingly smallest detail. That's why, that's why you have to profile the attack vector. You have to take a look at your threat models and say, all right, what am I r really willing to defend against? Right. What am I really willing to have secured? And, and we want our, the best bang for our buck. And, you know, we, 
we want it reasonably secured, right? Which is why we're able to, we're, we're willing to, to, you know, give so much and put so much towards the security. But we, 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 we know that we can never give 100%. So with that in mind, you know, there are a couple other things like telemetry, advertising, scams. Like HTTPS is not going to protect you from getting scammed. Oh, come on, Andrew. Come on. You can't make that guarantee. <laughs> not not today. Not today. <laughs> that's but that's also something that's that... I think that's hilarious that you brought that one up. Uh, that, that's... <laughs> Nothing more than comedy right there with that. <laughs> HTTPS isn't going to protect you from a scam. <laughs> and so I guess for anyone that, you know, just because it has HTTPS anymore, most sites should have that. That's just encrypting traffic. That's not, does, that doesn't mean it's a verified, you know, so, some uh, certificate, some certificates are issued via certificate authority. You can check like VeriSign and whoever, but, you know, we go out and get anyone can go out and get a Let's Encrypt cert anymore. So that doesn't mean you're signing. You know, if it says banking dot Russian website dot what is it R U, <laughs> that doesn't mean you're signing into your actual bank website. <laughs> just and it's over. That just means a traffic secure. <laughs> but man, that's a good one. <laughs> that's hilarious. <laughs> So those are those are the three things we you know we, we went over Lux um, encrypted tarballs HTTPS those are three things I think that is the service provider the operating system admin's responsibility. Right now we get down here to the third level here, which is the application administrator or the the consumer uh, of the of the service, and and there is actually still a weighty amount that they have to be responsible for. All right. First of all, they need to be not connecting to my bank.ru and preventing themselves from from that. But there's a couple other things too. So <laughs> so what we don't have then if if we 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 start thinking about this, we can we can implement Lux, which is going to be encryption at rest or as I like to say encryption at off. So if your server's off, it's encrypted. If your server's right. on, all bets are off. So what Nextcloud brings to the table is a couple different encryption types. And I'm going to actually start with their blog post encryption in Nextcloud because it, it really does a good job of highlighting what is available. We went over what encryption is. We went over threat modeling. So encryption in Nextcloud. Nextcloud offers multiple layers of encryption for your data. First, data is protected when being transferred between clients and servers, as well as between servers. Second, data can be encrypted on storage. And last but not least, we offer end-to-end -end encryption in the clients. Each has their place and offers a different kind of protection, suitable to protect from a specific type of threat and they go into these types of threats. Now we just talked about HTTPS, right? And they say Nextcloud uses plain and simple HTTP traffic for all file handling, which can be protected with TLS, which we do do. TLS protects against attacks to capture data in transit between the server and client. It does not protect against a hacked device or server, but prevents data transfers on insecure networks like public Wi-Fi networks, mobile devices, or third-party networks from being intercepted and is thus invaluable for Nextcloud deployment. That's something that we consider non-negotiable and implement by default and irreversibly. The next is storage encryption. And this one this one gets interesting, and you'll you'll see why in a second here. So the Nextcloud server-side encryption feature provides secure storage of data by encrypting each file with a unique file key before it's stored. File keys are encrypted in turn either by a server-wide key or a per-user key. Now that's important here. So you can do this one of two types of ways. You can either do this per server, so like per Nextcloud, 
like you have one Nextcloud instance, so that entire instance, or you can do it on a per user basis. Server-side encryption provides protection for data on external storage as the files are encrypted before they are sent to the server and the keys never leave the Nextcloud server. A server-wide key stores a server password in the Nextcloud data directory and uses it to decrypt the server key in the user's data directory, which is in turn used to decrypt data. So this means that if I can get to, and I'm going to flip this on its head, but if I can get to that server-wide key that's stored in the Nextcloud data directory, I can decrypt every user's key and therefore their files. Reading on. When using per-user keys, the keys in the data directory is per-user and encrypted with the user's password. Yeah, we take great care to ensure keys never enter storage, but keys will be kept in memory on the Nextcloud server for the duration of user login sessions to facilitate decryption and encryption of data. So to sum this up, we have two different types that we can do. We can have a master server-wide key, which is used to decrypt everything. Or we can have a per-user key, which is decrypted by the user's password itself. And then that's used to encrypt your personal stuff. Now, this is mainly for encrypting stuff to remote storage because what Nextcloud has the ability to do is operate on a backend storage like an object storage or any other kind of S3 compatible or NFS or yada, 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 right? So what you could do is you could have that key that's on your Nextcloud server and you can store stuff in your S3 bucket that's encrypted. Now that that remote storage doesn't have access to your server key. Only the server has access to the server key. So it's on your server, server can read it and encrypt stuff before it sends it onto right. the remote storage, right? But if you're talking about encrypting stuff with the server key on local storage, anyone who has access to that server as it's running has access to that key and right. therefore has access to all the storage locally. So your, your threat model here is if your S3 storage or your remote storage gets compromised, everything on there is encrypted if you're using a server-wide key. But if your Nextcloud server gets compromised, then everything on that Nextcloud server can be decrypted with the key that's also on your Nextcloud server. So that means that the server-side encryption protects data on storage as long as that storage is not on the same server as Nextcloud itself. That's with a huge asterisk though, because Per user keys only ad offer additional protection over a server-wide key in the case of physical theft of the Nextcloud server, which we're talking about. Someone grabs it and scampers yeah. off. Yeah. And storage or a security breach of the server itself, provided the users do not log in for the duration of the breach. Right. Because you can almost think of a per user key as a server-wide key on a different scale. You can say the the key that's stored on there decrypts all of my files, right? But luckily, sure. it's not stored there unencrypted. It's only unencrypted when I log in. So it's actually, if someone pops your server and you're able to, you know, they're, they're able to move around wherever they want and, and they can find your key, your key's still gonna be encrypted unless you're logged in. Now, how often does your mobile account log in? How often does your desktop client log in? every 30 seconds by default. So if that's the case, you're still, you know. Vulnerable to it, right. You're vulnerable to it. Yeah. So there's there's a little little caveat here. Now, if if your server goes offline, you know, and, and there's no Lux encryption on there, if that's not implemented yet, then yeah, you would you would not be logging in and you would not be decrypting your, your login key. Uh, but if if you have anything set up to sync, I mean that's really that's really a big big red flag to say hey this this isn't really going to prevent someone who's just squatting on that server from eventually figuring out what your data is. Now, on a, in addition to that, 
both these server-side encryption models do not protect against any type of uh, metadata attack. Like they can see all the files and folders and names sure. and directory sure. and who's logged in and everything. Right? They can they can see all of that stuff. You you know you're not encrypting the directory names of the file names or or whatnot. This, 2021 every, taxes taxes.csv right it's exactly fine you can exactly. see the file you can see it was last modified yep every everything's on there everything's on there for you so especially if you had you know two files you said show to the irs and then you had another file that said never show to the irs exactly you would know about the the presence of both of those files Without implementing remote storage, there's not a whole lot of benefit that you're going to grab from a server-side encryption, right? What you would be looking for is a file-level encryption or an even an end-to-end -end encryption, which is very, very hard to implement, but NextCloud has taken a lot of time to engineer this. Have you ever gone through any kind of, like, OPSEC or cryptography proofs or, or anything like that? Uh, you know what? I started to go through, I picked up a cryptography book. Um, is it Cracking the Code? Is that the big, is that the famous one? I started to go through it. I started to read the math and I was like, mm, nope. And then same, well, I was going through Bitcoin action. I was like, oh, let me just read about, you know, all the Shaw stuff and like. So I have here the handbook of applied cryptography. It's it's pretty bad. And and I wish I'd looked this up earlier, but but they have a they have a couple different things in here to consider. Yeah. So so like one of the things you're not going to think about about end to end encryption, right? And 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 I guess I'll touch on that really quick. So end to end encryption is basically um, I I start encrypting stuff on my device using my client and then send it up somewhere and then it's always encrypted to the server. Like the server knows nothing about it. It doesn't know the name, doesn't know the contents. It can't decrypt the contents. There's nothing up there. There's nothing I can do to decrypt it while it's still up there. The only thing I can do is copy it back down and decrypt it locally, right? Which is fairly secure because that means anyone who's sitting over on the other side of that server can't know anything. Right, right. But one of the interesting things is uh, the, the concept of using a browser to do this because they said, note that the very nature of end-to-end -end encryption means that there's no access to data through the web interface nor any public sharing. So we'll talk about drawbacks in a second here. The, uh, this is because a browser would need to decrypt the files locally for the user to see them. But the code to do that has to come in the form of JavaScript from the server. This would break the trust model End-to-end -end encryption is meant to protect from the server, and thus one can't trust the code from the server to decrypt the data and not send a copy of the secure key to a third-party server or what have you. So, so if you're trying to protect against a compromised server, you can't use code from that server to open something. You, you, you literally cannot trust it. You know, you could probably audit it, but are you going to do that every time you want to decrypt a file? Heck no. No. So this is only on the desktop clients and, and mobile clients that NextCloud authors. Now, this is actually a official application that they provide, um, which seems to be in a fairly alpha state. So I'm not even sure if I'm comfortable recommending this. To new people um, but what I would say is that the the rest of their end-to-end -end encryption is is a good read I mean it's it's what you would expect right they have a, a lot of good ideas um, they have identity protection they have trust on first use model you know just just different ways to set this up so that it makes sense and is easy and is also secure at the same time so they've they've done a good job don't get me wrong but there are a lot of drawbacks. You know, you can't access anything on the server. You know, we were talking about only Office before, right? You, you, if you encrypted an Office document using end-to-end -end encryption, right. you would not be able to open it on the server. The server cannot read it. Um, you know, you, you can't share 
anything with anyone because there's no files to be shared and and they can't decrypt it right so you can't the, currently you can't share it with anyone so there are a lot of drawbacks that there are currently with this and and I linked to a couple bits of documentation on uh, their end to end and you know what's up coming next and what's on their roadmap and and stuff to be implemented there uh, and and it all looks good right so I'm I'm very excited about it and, and I think that it definitely has its use case but for your every regular day to day operations of your next cloud service right this is going to be overkill and actually going to take away functionality that you would need that you would want you know it, it, that that next cloud is exposed i i can't tell you how many times this in the past week that i've been able to upload you know uh videos to someone to to share because i can't share it on on discord right, right? because it has an eight megabyte limit so like where am i supposed to put it do i have to create right. my own youtube channel and upload private unlisted videos and send them the link to it and to just put it on my no. file server they can download right. it or not up to them and i i, I think doing doing Without, something like right. this for literally everything literally everything takes away from really what you need to implement which i think well, is what we have planned. security it's there I think yeah. that I think that's one of the main the key points is it, if you need it it is there if you want to force people into using the cl- the desktop and the mobile client only and you're not going to share data outside of that next cloud instance it's available to you it's there but there in are also in practical alternatives use, to, yeah in practical use it's not I look at it as not something I would use on a day to day basis basically and and there are other things to do like there's c file i'm trying to remember what it is but there are applications that will just encrypt a file for you like if you want to do that i would say and and actually this is probably something i i should have gotten ready but there's there's like two or three applications that i've used in the past where i simply encrypted a, a file on my computer right and then once that file's encrypted and and i only know the password I can put that anywhere. I can put that up right. on Nextcloud. Right. I can do whatever I want, right? And I don't need like a fancy end-to-end encryption to you just to, put it up and yeah. it's already encrypted on the serve, you know, on di- on whatever disk. Doesn't matter. Exactly. You encrypted it already. Exactly. And when I pull it down, I'm going to have the decryption key or I can send someone the email with the decryption key and they can pull it down for their own selves. Yeah. Right, yeah. as long as you're you're on a device that has that that program to decrypt it, and you're using the correct parameters and and the password, and and that would be something out of band for Nextcloud. Nextcloud wouldn't even care about that, right? That would be something for you to set up in your own org. And really, you could do that with Nextcloud or sorry, Camboard's file uploads, or, or really uh, any other. Any, I, I'd say Bitwarden yeah. actually would probably be a better option for you even at that point. Uh, but yeah, there there's plenty of things you can do. Um, that are a much easier solution than than something like this. Now, they get some of these these kinks ironed out. It, it, it you know it, it may have its use in in small organizations, but uh, still, I think really where you're going to get the best bang for your buck as far as security is concerned, uh, you know the the realistic uh, exploits that we were talking about, right? If if you get that that data at rest, that encrypted data at rest and that data encryption in transport, that's where you're going to, to see the most security, the, the most easily maintained security posture um, and, and the, mo- the most bang for your buck, to be honest. And, right. and that's what I think I'm going to continue to pursue. Uh, that's uh, definitely still on the roadmap. And actually... Note to self, I think we're going to make that roadmap public by the next episode because uh, I, I don't see any reason why not to. I've been yeah. kind of going through it uh, in my head, especially the way we have it with the duplicated tasks to the Q2 project and then yeah. the child yeah, yeah, yeah. child tasks. I don't see any reason why we don't put that Publish into it, yeah. you know, public and, and, and expose that as a public roadmap. And then you'll see stuff. Uh, you'll see this exact stuff on there because this is stuff that we are uh, marching towards implementing. So most of this this information uh, I threw in the Nextcloud encryption uh, 
page. Uh, it's in the advanced customization chapter of the next cloud book. And I, I just thought it'd be, it'd be something good to go over. I mean, I've, I've gotten a couple queries before on it and I think it, it was a good time to just sit down and kind of hash out all the details in order for us to have answers when, when people ask these kind of questions or, or really anyone uh, asks these kind of questions, whether it's about Nextcloud, you know, or, or whether it's about anyone else's service. I mean, this is something that you should be asking of the operators of the services that you're, you're using. I mean, you, you should absolutely know if, if you're protected in transit, are you protected, you know, is your data protected at rest? Um, are you, you know, what, what are you doing about backup and, and, and other kinds of encryption? So uh, I, I thought this was a good place to start. If I have any more to add on it, uh, I certainly will do so, but I, I'm, I'm happy with, with what we were, with what I was able to come up with there. Yeah, absolutely. I liked it. I enjoyed it. I'm trying to think what I was laughing so hard at. Uh, oh yeah, HTTPS isn't going to prevent you from being scammed. <laughs> I'm to hold on to that tidbit. <laughs> oh, I got a kick out of that one. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to be the buzzkill. I mean, it kind of does. It kind of does. I mean, so hold on. What what are the cert types? Because you can get. Uh, you can get. Uh, there's a few. Um, here it is. Hold on. Types of SSL. There's like three, right? I there's remember three or this. Four. I remember this because I remember there's it went to serverguy.com before. Remember serverguy.com? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't remember that. There's three or four cert types, right? Yeah. So there is domain validated. There's organization validated and extended validated. Extended yeah. Validation. Oh, and that extended validated is a fortune. Yeah. Yeah. But that's what key.com gets. Uh, and and then you'll see in the browser too. I mean, your your browser will show you know whether your connection is secure, uh, and then whether it's secured by an organization validated cert. It's going to be green instead of just the lock. And if it's an extended validation cert, it's going to be green plus the lock plus the name of the institution, you know, next to the URL that is actually validated. And I think that's pretty cool that's that's a way and and also that's an upsell too i mean you're you're upselling people on that's your brand the ability for other people to trust you yeah exactly right. you're, you're selling that brand so uh very interesting to see that and 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 yeah so i mean if you go to key.com and it doesn't say key.com it's probably not key.com if you didn't mention it it's honestly even if it's just a quick link like Obviously, you're gonna go to when some, whenever the bank sends a note, you're gonna I'm gonna type in the bank address on my URL. Some people are will click the link, which can redirect you, and you're like, oh well, they sent me there, and it, you know all the UI looks the same. It's like, well, you're getting hacked. Yeah, bank key bank that are you <laughs> key dot are you? <laughs> no, but um, I did enjoy that one because it you know anymore it, it someone's getting scammed every day. So, yep. Um, but yeah, is there anything else you wanted to add? I, I thought you did a great job explaining well, it. Now, applied crypto cryptography we'll have to save for a uh, another day. I think. I I couldn't I couldn't. Oh man. But yeah, I, I think you were going going to go over how to scam friends and influence people. That's What's exactly the... right. <laughs> sure. <laughs> it's uh no the grab bag this week just diving right back in kind of right where we left off last i'll say last episode is how to win friends and influence people part two so if you guys remember uh there's three parts to the book unfortunately i don't have them right in front of me but this is oh there's four parts to the book there's four parts to the book so this is part two of four and this this one is oh man Give me a second. I thought it was. Uh, I was under the impression. Do this, and you'll be a welcome anywhere. I think is no, the... no, 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 no. It's right above that. Oh, it's ways to make people like you. Ways to make people like you. Okay, and then the the parts within. I think there were six. Yeah, uh, the six chapters. Week. Yep. Six chapters this week. Yeah. So it's. Uh, I'll just go over them real quick here. It's do this, and you'll be welcome anywhere. A simple way to make a good first impression. Uh, if you don't do this, you're headed for trouble. An easy way to be a good conversationalist, and Oh no, there's two more here. How to interest people and then how to make 
people like you instantly. So I just want to dive into the six real quick here. Um, I had, I had big, I had bigger, I had more notes for some of the chapters and then for the other ones I didn't take much out of. Um, so this first chapter in this part two was do this and you'll be welcome anywhere. And really going back to what you kind of talked on last week and really what the main point of the book is showing a genuine interest in others, not only wins you fr wins friends for you, but may develop in customers, a loyalty to your company in you don't even have to read the second part there. It's the first showing a genuine interest in others wins friends for you. I mean, that's if you didn't want any, if you didn't take any, anything away from the grab bag, then that you'd be sitting pretty good. Um, so in that chapter, they kind of say, if we want to make friends, let's greet people with animation and enthusiasm. When somebody calls you on the telephone, use the same psychology, say hello in tones that, bespeak how pleased you are to have the personal call and have have the person be excited to talk to him right be excited sure be excited to talk to him many companies train their telephone operators to greet all callers in a tone of voice that radiates interest and enthusiasm the caller feels the company is concerned about them uh, and it let let's let's remember that when we answer the phone tomorrow uh, so i found that very interesting because i have to deal with uh, with vendors that are in a different country and some of the times you pick they pick up the phone and you can tell they don't want to be there and look I didn't want to make the phone call in the first place, but we're I got to get to the solution here like You know a hello that uh, a hello. How are you in a nice voice sounds a lot better than What can you what hello? What can we do? You know hello? What can we do for you today? What's wrong? <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure you know you've, you know some people want to talk and love would you know, are sound like they're interested in talking to you and get to know them. They radiate that kind of, I don't know, vibrance is what I'd call it. And some people you just say, all right, look, we're going to have the short conversation and then be done. And obviously I'm way more interested in the person who's interested in me. Right. Um, so there you go. Line. I got it in the show notes there. We are interested in others when they're interested in us. Another <laughs> key takeaway of the book. Uh, and then the principle is become genuinely interested in other people. And really, I'd say these kind of six chapters dive into being genuine and how to make, how to make them, how to ask, I guess, better questions that are tailored towards both their interest and stuff that interests them. Well, and, and how to two how to demonstrate that you are right. becoming genuinely interested in them. So I don't know if you had anything to add on that one. It, the one I took away, it's basically smile when you answer the phone. I think that was in this. It's do you do smile that? when you talk, smile when you answer the phone. I usually try to. Um, I think this actually second chapter, it might dive more into it. It's um, smiling when you answer the phone. Yeah, oh yeah, there it is. A simple way to get so. A simple way to make a good first impression, uh, the effect of a smile is powerful, even when it's unseen. Your smile comes through in your voice. Uh, and then there were a couple examples here that I really liked. I'll, I can kind of read through them. Well, I mean, so we were we were talking last episode about examples, how they how they stuck yeah. in your head. Yeah. And it, it seems like these did. So, I mean, you know, they why? They totally did. I guess. They totally did. Yeah. I really liked them. Um, so this one was... Uh, basically about being enthusiastic about whatever it is you're selling, doing whatever it is. Uh, so this is just a quote from a, an example organization. And it said that uh, the chairman of the board of directors of one of the largest rubber companies in the United States told me that according to his observation, people rarely succeed at anything unless they have fun doing it. I'm sure that's for many reasons, whether they want to quit because it's too hard. If they're not enjoying, if you're not enjoying it, you're basically just going to say, all right, I'm going to, quit it you know there what's the there, you're not going to find the passion in it, you're not going to find the enjoyment in it you're going to just say this is a chore more than anything I, you know don't want to do this or whatever but if you have fun doing it you're going to basically keep pushing on keep succeeding keep doing what you're doing um so i i really like the example another interesting point i read i came across from this chapter was also that i think there was someone who was hiring and 
it actually wasn't the smartest guy that got the job. It was the guy who came in and he was most interested in the position. And he was the, mo he was the one both most, en most, en most enthused about the work and just someone who seemed like not only were they interested, they seemed like they had fun, you know, had fun running into the problems and solving the issues that were kind of coming up. So instead of hiring the, you know, top of the class, whatever, they ended up with the, not the smart, not the brightest guy or whatever, but the guy that was going to enjoy doing it and had a passion for it. So the next few things here, getting, get into kind of smiling and enthusiasm, uh, mm. which I really liked. So it's, you don't feel like smiling, then what? So two things first, and this sucks because <laughs> I don't know if you've had days where you're just like, I'm, I'm done. You wake up and you go, work just comes right at you. And you're like, I'm done. I'm freaking done. This is terrible. But I think this is hilarious. And this is kind of one of those suck it up type moments. It's uh, you don't feel like smiling. Then what? Two things. First, force yourself to smile. Well, that is the worst. If someone said, if someone walked up to me on a, like a day where I was slammed with work and said, oh, force yourself to smile. I would be livid. I would be livid. But First, force yourself to smile. If you're alone, force yourself to whistle or hum a tune or sing. Act as if you're already happy and that will tend to make you happy. Here's the way psychologist and other and philosopher William James put it. Action seems to follow feeling, but rarely action and feeling go together. And by regulating the action, which is under the more direct control of the will, we can indirectly regulate the feeling, which is not. Thus, the sovereign voluntary path to cheerfulness, if our cheerfulness be lost, is to sit up and cheerfully act and speak as if cheerfulness were already there. I'm going to have to try it out and let everyone know how it goes. Because walking into like a complete storm at work and just being immediately kind of put in like a, a fire, and maybe I will have to stand up and start humming or singing or something and testing it out to see how it goes. Um, uh, <laughs> because I haven't done it. Usually I just sit down and I just work through it. Just like, mm, this, you know, and I end up, I'm not in a bad mood the whole day, but I have to physically get out and do something or, you know, go run or whatever, just clear my mind. Um, but I'm not to try it, just stand up and sing or smile or something cheerful. See if it goes away. I'll have to let everyone know how it goes. Um, and then just kind of an end quote to the chapter. Um, everybody in the world is seeking happiness. Uh, and there is one sure way to find it. That is by controlling your thoughts. Happiness doesn't depend on our outward conditions. It depend on depends on our inner conditions. So kind of going back to you have to make yourself. You have to take the action and then the feeling will follow. Is basically what it well, boils down to. Yeah, and that's and then, that's the old, you know, fake it till you make it a dodge. Yeah, absolutely. But this is with actions into feelings, which I never even thought about. I always kind of thought of it as like a not ego thing, but like a you know, like, like an imposter syndrome kind of thing. Kind of, yeah, kind of like that. Yeah, rather than you know, I feel like terrible today. Let me sing and see how that affects my mood. I guess. So there is a thing that I have not looked into, emotional toil. And, well, here's, here's a good one. We know toil as hard work requiring great effort. Sure. So emotional toil is running the emotional gambit, to use another figure of speech. It's hard work taxing to get back to the notion of, of in post. So it's it's when you have... When you're specifically in a professional setting, but it could also be in a relationship or it could sure. be in, in what have you. But it's the responsibility that you have to other people to take care that your emotional state does not negatively affect theirs. Right. Now, it's not as direct harm as, you know, punching them in the face, but it is still something that could be a detriment to everyone in the room. Right. When, right. when you do go in there. And when you say, I'm, I'm having a bad day, and I'm just going to act like it. One of the things I got out of the Primal Leadership book that's kind of been sitting in the back of my mind is that a lot of the good leaders were rated very, very highly on their sense of humor. Right? And if you're known as being very, very 
having having a good sense of humor and you come in one day without that sense of humor you know that's going to affect everyone around you right someone's everyone's going to know that something's off right and 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 maybe that's what you need maybe you need to have a sit down and talk with someone or you need someone to come to your rescue or whatnot but you can't let that affect everyone else around you right that's selfish um and and really there's there's no great way to reverse it right not even ice cream is going to really get you in a good mood because at the end of the you know at the end of the tub it's just you know you feel like crap and... <laughs> now you're now you're really done dug yourself in a hole <laughs> exactly uh so i i think this is as good as a way as as any and would be interested to see yeah how that how that goes for you yeah so the principle at the end of this one is smile now the four smile i'll tell you what i'm gonna feel like it's gonna be like case of mondays type thing it's gonna be i'm gonna be livid once <laughs> when uh walk in to a complete storm like oh let me just stand up and smile i'm sure i'll just take it as the <laughs> let me just stand up and smile yeah so <laughs> i'll have to let you know how it goes um jumping into the next Jumping in the next chapter, that one got me all fired up, excited, because I'm sure, <laughs> um, I'm sure it'll be something bad. I'm just like, oh, let me just stand up and smile. <laughs> so, uh, uh, the next the next chapter here is uh, if you don't do this, you're headed for trouble. This one, I there were no good examples for. The principle was the. I, I'll just go to the principle because I feel like the principle gives a pretty good summary, gives a good kind of to do the chapter was about remembering people's names um remember that a person's name to them is the sweetest and most important sound in any language i guess my question to you would be do you have a way to manage and track people's names do you do that anyway at all or do you just kind no. of go off memory in your head there's i know there's, there's stuff out there i don't know if you've heard matomo it was like the one i used for a little bit to like track like you just do like track interactions with people you've talked to and everything but I did it for a little bit and then just never, never kind of touched it again. I didn't know if you'd mess with any of that kind of software. It's I'm going to bring this up, but I'm probably also going to talk about it next episode because yesterday there's an article coming out that said Dunbar's number debunked. Now the, the principle behind the Dunbar number is that you can have at most 150 friends, right? Sure. Yeah. You're going to have 150 people that you track their uh, track their lives and, and you maintain relationships with them and, and keep up with them. And uh, so there's there's somewhat of a hard limit there to, to say, all right, this is this is kind of the cutoff. I can't really do more than that. Um, so what I like to do is is maintain a, a core group of people around me you know my my core friend group yeah uh, yeah and then leave some cognitive surplus open for me to care about other people like as people come into my life and it, it could be for a really quick relational transaction right but as as people come into my life i let myself care about them Right. And, and I mean, that's literally what we've been talking about this whole time. Yeah. Right. And yeah, there are little ways like repeating it after they say it, making sure to say it at least once in a conversation or once every time you speak in a conversation. There are, you know, writing it down in your, your address book and associating it. You could use mnemonics. There's there's all these little tricks. Yeah. However you want to remember it. Right. All you have to do is care enough to either use the system that you've put in place to do it or just remember it as a as a, a force of habit to, to remember a friend's name. So I can't say that I've historically been very good at that. I've been getting better as I've been able to start caring about people as shallow as that sounds. Uh, you, sure, you really yeah. you remember people's names when you care about them. Totally. Totally. Um, but it is important not only just to remember their names, but I think what he's trying to get at here is to say their names. Right. Say it to them. It's, yeah, that's exactly right. Not just remembering it, it's saying it to them. Because who doesn't like hearing their own name, right? Remember that a person's name is 
to that person the sweetest and most important sound in any language. Sure, absolutely. Everyone likes hearing their own name. The next chapter was an easy way to be a good conversationalist. There was one good example of this, and it was about, I think Dale himself was asking someone on a flight, or no, it was a cocktail party. It was a cocktail party he was at. And he said to this woman, he's just started up like an easy, you know, small talk first. And then he was sitting on the couch next to her or whatever. And sure enough, he said, she said something about Africa. And he said, oh, I've never been. Have you ever been to Africa? And sure enough, he said this woman talked for 45 minutes about Africa. And he just let her, he basically just let her go. He just said, hey, yeah, I've never been to Africa. What have you done there? And she just started going and he just kept asking questions as she went and just let her let her talk, basically. Um, people love talking about themselves. Basically, you have to be a good listener, though, and kind of I, encourage I, them to talk about themselves. I believe the end of that conversation was something along the lines of her – remarking to her friend after the conversation or something. Oh, he's such an excellent conversationalist. Or yeah. Something like right. That. And she just talked about herself for <laughs> 45 minutes. Yeah. Uh, and then I loved, I pulled out this other kind of quote out of context here. I loved it. I thought it was kind of hilarious. Uh, a person's toothache means more. A person's toothache means more to that person than a famine in China, which kills a million people. A boil on one's neck interests one more than 40 earthquakes in Africa. Think of that the next time you start a camp conversation. I've actually started to use this because I didn't think of, I didn't even, I've read the book before and some of it, you know, you read so much content and it's just some of it just gets skipped over. You don't think about it. Reading it the second time through, I'm like, the guy's right. People love talking. It's always I, I, I feel like I don't talk about, I love talking about myself. Who doesn't? Who doesn't love talking about themselves? But it's about talking about the other person to get them to, you know, they probably love talking about themselves too. So I found it very interesting. Uh, the principle was be a good listener and encourage others to talk about themselves. Now, the following chapter kind of leads into that with how to interest people. It's the opening line of the chapter. It's uh, everyone who was ever a guest of Theodore Roosevelt's was astonished at the range and diversity of his knowledge. Whether his visitor was a cowboy or a rough rider, a New York politician or a diplomat, Roosevelt knew what to say. How was it done? The answer was simple. Whenever Roosevelt expected a visitor, he sat up late the night before, reading on the subject which he knew his guest was particularly interested. For Roosevelt knew, as all leaders know, the loyal that the royal road to a person's heart is to talk about the things he or she treasures, treasures most. And kind of going back to the example from Africa, I'm sure that woman loved to travel. And guess what? I think they kind of just lucked out on a topic that she enjoyed and that, you know, it was her doing, it was her going to Africa. It wasn't her studying the history of Africa. It was her, you know, safari trip to Africa, which, you know, kind of hitting two birds with one stone there. She's able to talk about herself and her trip. And he's just able to kind of ask, you know, easy questions that keep the conversation going. So I thought this was hilarious that the example they used, I really enjoyed it, was that Teddy Roosevelt would stay up the night before studying topics. Now, I don't know if it's true or not, but still just very fascinating to me that he would, st you know, the concept of his, him staying up late to learn about a topic for someone else. When they didn't have Google, they had books. Right, right. You got to go find probably an encyclopedia or something. No wiki, no wiki page for that. Um, so principle five is uh, talk in terms of the other person's interests, which, again, they all kind of blend in that same making it about the other person, I felt like, which was, uh, you know, being involved in the other person's interests. So what do they like? Yeah, and it's a way to show that you you are becoming genuinely interested in them. Yeah. yeah. And then this last chapter was the same thing. It's that genuine interest it's you know how to pe make people like you instantly and it falls off the same it's that same concept it's uh the, the example from this chapter was that there was a dog breeder and i i think this was dale again talking with the dog breeder and he said oh my gosh you breed these dogs let me ask you about these dogs you have a barn let's go check these dogs out and then he just started you know asking these questions and the breeder just kept talking and you know talking and talking and talking and the breeder said finally to him 
hey, don't you have a son? And Dale was like, not just not just that, but Dale was talking about his accomplishments. Yeah, as as the the breeder's accomplishments. Right. He was talking about everything, all the awards he'd won and everything the breeder had done. And I love it. He said, Dale, don't you have a son? And I, Dale was like, oh, yeah, he's in, I think it was an infant at the time or a young, young boy. And sure enough, the breeder said, okay, do you want my, one of my, I think he was just breeding at the time, world-class pup, you know, world-class puppies. And sure enough, Dale said yes. So... He was, Dale wasn't even expecting anything back from this guy. He's just interested in him to be interested in him. He was expecting no return. It was that genuine interest that kind of led the breeder to say, hey, look, I have I have one of these. Do you want it? And Well, that, and, and, and part of that genuine interest was saying, tell me about why you're important, right? Let me, let me give you the stage to demonstrate your importance, all the, all the stuff you've won, all the stuff you've done, all, you know, how how you've you, how you made it in your your own field the principle is make the other person feel important and do it do it sincerely you know and 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 whether you're in this for the services that we offer or if you just like what we have to say in the the podcast or you know interested in, in keeping up on on news you know we're we're growing this community we're right we're we're here to be genuinely interested in stuff that you're interested, right? I mean, we we already share a common interest. Let's let's kind of dive into that and and go through that. So, um, go to rcompose.com, right? That's that's where you're going to sign up for the mailing list, and then that mailing list will let you know when we have more episodes like this coming out, when we have uh, demonstration videos coming out, um, and how to keep up with our community, right? And we're going to keep you updated on all, all the latest developments uh, that we do on our Compose as well. And with that, we hope you enjoyed this episode of our Composecast. Thank you, be safe, and we'll see you all in two weeks. Bye, everybody.